These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. It's, it's a one bromobutane mm -hmm. uh, reacting with sodium iodide. In an SN2 reaction. Like this? Uh, yes. And then the other uh, and the other one is, I guess the other one is actually two brom uh, bromo uh, propane. Like this? Yes. Okay. okay. And we have to write the products for both. And I and the, the obviously the top one I didn't have much problem with because it's a little bit different, but I get a little bit uh, confused when we're in there between two carbons. Okay. And writing the product. I don't know how many of my OCHEM videos you've had a chance to see. I watched one thing that I think is very important is numbering the carbon chain. You were saying? I watched the whole series that you had on okay. SN2 and, okay. and SN1. So your class, uh, I thought you'd already started OCHEM. Your class is still just on SN2 and SN1? Yeah. I guess the first quarter went, went kind of slow. Well, okay. Well, this is the second quarter of it. Yeah, usually I, okay. All right, fair enough. Well, then actually there should be a lot of videos online that might be helpful to you there. All right, so we're actually at the elimination rate. He went over elimination reactions before right. he did SN1 and SN2. Okay, well, I, I'm going to have definitely have some videos on that already. All right, so does it make sense that this iodide really has a negative charge? So it should be the nucleophile. Now, which carbon is it attacking? One, two, or three? It's uh, the two carbon. Because that's the one in the leaving group. Yeah. All right, and now we have to draw the product. Uh, now, there's a, a right way and a wrong way to draw the product. The wrong way is the draw what feels good technique. That doesn't work. Instead, we have to take the one atom at a time technique. One atom at a time. So I'm going to start with the number one atom. Uh, now you tell me, who is the number one atom connected to when you're ready? Um, who exactly is the number one atom connected to in the final product? In the, in, it's going to be connected to, well, which one are we referring as the number one atom? Oh, can you see this? This okay. is the one I number okay. as number one. So who should that be referred to? That's a kind of a straightforward question. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure what, what the question is. Uh, the question is, who should the number one atom be attached to in the final product? Well, let me ask you this. Who is the number one atom attached to in the starting the material? Second carbon. OK. Yeah. Who is the number two attached to in the starting material? Uh, in the starting it's, material. It's, it's attached to the uh, bromine, and then it's attached uh, between the one and the three. And it's attached to the number three. Second Good. Three. And who is the number three carbon attached to? Uh, the number two. Okay, now I want to go through that same process for the product. And I want to ask who is each atom attached to? Number one is attached to carbon number two. Okay, so we'll take our time with that. Here's the number two. All right, and now again we have to take our time. Who is the number two going to be attached to? At this point, uh, is this atom? the final atom? product. Okay, it's going to be attached to the, uh, the uh, nucleophile, which is the iodide. Okay. And then it's going to also remain attached to number three carbon. How do we know that the number two is going to be attached to the iodide? Well, that's what this arrow here tells us. The important thing is to realize we're not taking a guess to the product. The arrows tell us exactly what the product looks like. Once we understand the arrows, they tell us exactly what the product looks like. Now, how do you know the number two isn't attached to the bromine anymore? Because uh, it would leave five bonds on a carbon. It would, it would, it would. That is a very good point. Uh, there's an even better point, though. How do we know the number two is not attached to the bromine? Because the arrow tells us so. That's the key lesson that students have to internalize about OCHEM. The arrows are our masters. The arrows tell us exactly what changes to make. This arrow tells us to make a bond between the iodine and the number two. And this arrow tells us to break the bond between the number two and the bromine. That's why I said you can't use the draw what feels good technique. Instead, you have to use the draw what the arrows tell you to technique. Uh, and then you have to take your time with that. Um, and so uh, what happened to the bromine? Well, it's over here. Uh, one thing that's important to always change two charges at the initial tail and the final head. Well, this iodide started negative and it's losing electrons, so it should end up neutral. And the bromine started neutral and it's gaining electrons, so it should end up uh, negative. And um, 
the convention is uh, we know that this ionic bond is breaking because the iodine is losing its charge. Well, then we can form a new ionic bond between the sodium and the bromine. And uh, I think these would be the final products right here. This is an SN2 reaction, right? Which means it should only be one step. So there's only one step that we have to go through for an SN2 reaction. I have just one question. Conceptually, why is the sodium breaking from the iodide? Why, what, what, uh, this is where I have a little bit of, why is the iodide cho uh, choosing to leave the sodium? Sure. Uh, let's see here. So the basic idea here is, basically what you're asking is, why is the iodide ha at the tail of an arrow? Yeah. You're asking, why is the iodine at the tail of an arrow? Well, it's all about the charges. The iodide here it has an ionic bond, which means that it has a full negative charge. But does nature like charges? Yeah. No, that's again the whole key to organic chemistry. Uh, if a student can just accept that it's all about the charges, that's a big quantum leap forward. Nature doesn't like charges. So you were you're basically asking me, why was the iodide unhappy? in the starting materials? And the answer is it was unhappy in the starting materials because it had this negative charge over here. Notice here the iodine now has a zero formal charge. So that's the improvement from the iodine's point of view. It broke away from this ionic bond so it could get rid of this negative charge over here. And, and that's a covalent bond? No. This one here? Yeah. This between these? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. How do we know that it's covalent? Um, because it's between two things from the right-hand side of the periodic table. That's another very important principle. If you have two atoms on the right-hand side of the periodic table, remember that covalent means that they're sharing the electrons. Well, which electrons would be willing to share electrons that have similar electronegativities from the same side of the periodic table? So iodine and carbon have similar electronegativities. That's why this was also covalent, because these are also from the right-hand side. How did I know this was ionic? Because these are from opposite sides of the periodic table. Here we have a metal and a non-metal. Again, when this was originally drawn, they might have just showed it as sodium iodide. It's an important skill in OCHEM. Anytime you see a non-metal bonded to a metal, or usually when you see a non-metal bonded to metal, your first job is to draw in the charges for the ionic bond. Otherwise, like we said, otherwise, like you said, we can't understand why the iodine is even going through the reaction. Um, usually in organic chemistry, they show you the formal charges. But the one case where sometimes they don't show you the formal charges is in ionic bonds, because we're expected to know this is an ionic bond. So you really have to go in and put those charges in yourself, just like I did here. So that was a good question. Uh, again, we're not just making up the arrows that we feel like drawing. We have to put in the arrows that are justified by the charges. Why should this be at the tail? Because it has a negative. Why should this carbon be at the head? Because it has a partial positive. Negative things like to be at tails, and partial positives like to be at heads. All right, of course, so if, if, if we had, uh, if we had a different molecular structure at one and three, then we might not necessarily get the SN2 reaction because of sterics? That's right, although um, the most important structure is the structure at two, okay. because these are a little bit far away to block. So the big obstacle here is steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Well, putting something on number three or one might block the nucleophile, but what would be much worse is putting something on the number two. If I put a new carbon on the number two, that would totally block the nucleophile because it's much closer. This is what I called in the videos the alpha carbon. Uh, so blocking the alpha carbon is the big problem. In fact, here it would be impossible to do SN2 because now this is tertiary. Tertiaries can't do SN2. There might be small effects by putting substituents on the one and three, but they're not nearly as important as what's on the alpha carbon. So the big lesson there is focus on how much steric hindrance there is on the alpha carbon. Okay. The carbons further away uh, are much less important. All right. Uh, okay, so again, uh, this would be the product over here. Uh, the important lesson here was again, notice how I drew this one question at a time. I said, who's attached to the number one? Then who's attached to the number two? Then who's, uh, and that was pretty much it. And I used the arrows to tell me which new bonds were forming and which new bonds were breaking. The mistake that people make is they just try to take a guess and hope for the best. Uh, it doesn't work, you have to do that one step at a time. Is this a stereo center? Um, no. No. That's why we didn't have to worry about wedges and dashes. If this was a stereocenter, we would have to worry about whether this wasn't a wedge or a dash. But because this is not a stereocenter, that's not an issue on this particular problem. OK. okay. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Sorry, is that? Yes. So one thing we saw was how to use numbering to draw the products. And we also saw um, if you got a metal and a non-metal, you should draw in the charges for an ionic bond. Otherwise, you can't predict what's going to happen.